A look outside the Beltway at the South Carolina State House in Columbia. But joining us now from Nashville is Florida Senator Marco Rubio, who scored a second place finish in South Carolina. Senator, congratulations and welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. You declared flatly last night that you're going to win the nomination, but don't you first have to win a state? And if so, which is the first state you're going to win? Well, we do, and we're going to find out, and we have to win more than one. So it's been difficult up to this point because we've had a lot of people in this race. I mean, so you have Donald Trump sitting at around 30 percent or so nationally, sometimes under, sometimes a little over. And then you have 70 percent of the Republican electorate does not support Donald Trump. But that 70 percent has been divided up between five to seven people. As this race continues to narrow, I think that'll be easier and easier for that 70 percent to coalesce. And so that's why I feel so good, obviously, about our results last night. Uh, I give a lot of credit to Trey Gowdy and Tim Scott and Nikki Haley who came on board and helped us finish strong there. But now this race is getting narrower and I believe it's literally down to three people who are running full scale national campaigns. And I, and I feel more and more positive now going into some of these states including where I am here this morning in Tennessee that our chances continue to grow now. And we, we will, especially as we get into the winner take all states that are coming up soon, we have to start winning states and we will. Let's talk about that. Jeb Bush dropped out last night. Are you calling on John Kasich and Ben Carson to also drop out so that the party, the rest of the party, that 70 percent, can begin to unite around you? And, and please don't give me the it's up to them answer. I mean, would it be good for the party for the others to drop out and make this a three-man race? Well, first, I do have to give you that answer because I'm no one to tell anyone to drop out. I mean, John Kasich is out there working as hard as I am, and he's been doing this almost as long as we have, and he has every right to make that decision for himself. But would it you be know, best the Kasich for the party? campaign is largely based in one place. Well, I think that's for him. I'm, I'm not going to. I believe that the sooner we can coalesce, uh, the better we're going to be as a party in general. I mean, and so certainly, but I'm not here to tell him to do whatever he needs to do. It's going to happen one way or another. There's a natural process that's going to take hold. I think the question is the timing. It's clear that John Kasich is going to focus, I think, entirely on Michigan. Um, and at least that's what he's announced. And uh, yeah, it's his right to do that. But we're going to continue to work everywhere. Today, we'll be in three states. We finish up tonight in Nevada after start, stopping in Arkansas, first starting here in Tennessee. We're going to compete everywhere. And we feel good about that coalescing happening in all those places where these other candidates are not. All right. You say that this is now a three man race. So I want you, uh, lightning round rules, to do a little comparison shopping. Why should a voter who's undecided choose you over Donald Trump? Well, I think one of the reasons why is we have a real sense of optimism about America's future. I'm realistic about our challenges, but I'm very optimistic about our future. And we need someone that will restore, a campaign that will restore our confidence in who we are as a people and what we're capable of and, doing. And Trump won't do we that? We also need real answers to real problems. Rhetoric is not enough. Well, I think Donald's campaign has largely been about how bad things are. And there's no doubt we need to recognize how difficult things are. But you can't just say you're going to make America great again. You have to ex explain how you're going to do it. I mean, at this stage in the campaign, voters deserve to know in great detail just exactly how it is that you are going to achieve some of these things that you're saying you're going to achieve with specific public policy. So I look forward to having a policy debate. If we can make it a policy debate, um, and, and we'll see what direction he wants to go. But, uh, but I think that's a big difference in this campaign. And then just a, a fundamental understanding of foreign policy, which I think is critical for the commander in chief to have on day one. To this point now, uh, three states in, he still has not really demonstrated that. But again, we'll see. As the weeks go on, maybe he'll spend some time and learn more about it, and we can have a debate about those issues. And uh, we, we understand the case you're making for yourself. What about you versus Ted Cruz? Well, look, Ted is very weak on national security. He has voted repeatedly against budget items regarding the defense budget, whether it's the Na Defense Authorization Act or voting for Rand Paul's budget that slashed defense spending. So you'll have to answer for that. And I just think voters are growing increasingly troubled by the ten tenor of his campaign. He's literally every day making up things. Um, you saw today one of his supporters, I believe in Illinois, a, a, a member of his campaign, said that they're becoming concerned about this and, and are thinking about maybe getting out of the campaign as a result of it. So, um, you know, it's very disturbing. But, of course, on the record, the national security stuff, he's just very weak on national let, security let, issues. I think that hurt him in South Carolina and it's going to hurt him elsewhere. Let me uh, talk to you about that second side of it, because things seem to have gotten personal between you and Ted Cruz, with you accusing him of lying and his campaign of playing dirty tricks. And, and here's what you said, and I want to put these pictures up side by side. 
Uh, this was a, the real picture on the left, and on the right was the Photoshop version that appeared to show you shaking hands with President Obama and the idea that you two were together on the trade pact. Here's what you said after that. The picture's fake. It's a Photoshop of someone else shaking hands, and it appears it isn't even Barack Obama either. So I think this is now a disturbing pattern, guys. It's a disturbing pattern. Every day they're making things up. In this case, they literally made up a picture. Straight out, do you believe that Ted Cruz has the integrity, the character, to be president, or do you think there's something missing there? Well, I think certainly in his campaign it's missing. Um, I've never seen this behavior from him before up until he started running for president and, and in the last couple of weeks. Look, I mean, the other night a gentleman fainted at one of my events. We stopped the event. I stopped and said a prayer for him, and it was an hour as his campaign was sending out robocalls in South Carolina telling people that I had s cut off my, camp my uh, event short and had announced that if I didn't win in South Carolina, I would be dropping out. I mean, it's just, these are little things, but they add up, and they're important. It's very, you know, th this sort of pattern is very, very disturbing. And we, we're all used to rough and tumble here and people playing on the edges, but to just literally make things up. In a week, he's been rebuked by National Right to Life on my position on Planned Parenthood. He's misstated my position on marriage. You know, did robocalls in Spanish to English-speaking households in South Carolina, uh, trying to, I guess, you know, offend pe people against me. So it's just very bizarre. It's an ongoing pattern. It happens every single day now. He did robocalls on the Confederate flag against Donald Trump in South Carolina, a very difficult and painful issue in South Carolina that he wanted to reignite. So bottom line is, you conduct a campaign like that, it's going to reflect on, on you, it's going to reflect on your campaign. And I think ultimately, if it continues, it does say something about your ability to govern this country. Of course, while you are making uh, statements, comparison shopping uh, about the other candidates, they're making it about you. And one of the knocks is whether or not you are willing to do the hard work of government. And I want to put up a couple of statistics that came out this week. There was a report that you've missed 60 percent of the hearings of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee since you joined the Senate. And after 9-11, the Florida House, where you were then a member, set up a special committee on security lapses. You skipped almost half the meetings and missed more than 20 votes. The, the suggestion, Senator, is that you're always more interested in the next job than the job that you currently, currently hold. Well, first of all, about the Florida House one, that was like 15 years ago. I was also the majority whip, and so I had significant responsibilities outside of the committee, and you can't be in two places at once. And that actually explains the people who wrote that about the Senate don't understand the Senate. When it comes to Foreign Relations Committee and the Senate, you could have three committees meeting at the exact same time, literally. You could have an Intelligence Committee meeting going on at the same time as a Foreign Relations Committee, so no one can go to every hearing 100% of the time. It's literally impossible to do it. It's not like you're out playing golf or at the spa. It's just that you have something else happening at the same time. So I'd have to go back and look at the record of it. But for the most part, I can tell you that uh, for us, the, the thing about being in the Senate is sometimes you, you can't be at every hearing because there is another committee that might be having votes, the Commerce Committee or the Intelligence Committee. And so you have to be there instead of the other committee. You just can't be in two places at once. That wouldn't just be true for me. That would be true for virtually anyone who's in the Senate who serves in multiple committees, as I do. Finally, Senator, you got a big boost this week, and a lot of the late deciders went for you after you got the endorsement of the popular governor of South Carolina, who endorsed you over Jeb Bush especially. A lot of observers think that the two of you would make a good ticket for Republicans, young, uh, members of minorities. I, I was struck last night at your uh, statement. I mean, not only were you there as a member of minority and Nikki Haley, also Tim Scott, an African-American, the senator. How attractive and appealing is that to you to, to present a different face of the Republican Party? Well, first, let me say that one of the, obviously, Nikki Haley's endorsement was a big deal. But in the process, I also gained a friend. And we've become friends over the last three days. And I've grown to really like her and admire her. We, love, we have a lot in common, and so I think that really helped us hit it off, and, and I enjoy very much campaigning with her, and we look forward to her deploying her on the road to other places as well. And Tim Scott is a dear friend and someone who also has a lot in common in terms of kind of where we come from and how we grew up, although he faced some real difficult circumstances as a young child. So uh, as far as the, look, that's who we are. I mean, that's what the Republican Party is. I was on a town hall the other night on national television. And I was asked about it, and someone made an allusion to, you know, something about the tone of 
the campaign with regards to appealing to minorities. And I said, just today, I was endorsed by the daughter of Indian American immigrants, who's the governor of South Carolina, a long standing alongside an African American Republican U.S. Senator, both of whom were there to support a Cuban American U.S. Senator. It's pretty amazing that the Republican Party is indeed the party of diversity. It is the only party where you have so many people of so many different backgrounds on a national stage. I'm very proud of that. I got we're going to continue to showcase that. I got, of course, ten, I, got ten, I got 10 seconds. You say you gained a friend in Nikki Haley. Did you gain a running mate? Well, it's presumptuous to say that, but I think she's very talented, uh, and, and I think she's going to be on the top of everyone's list. Whether she's interested or not, you'll have to ask her, but she will certainly be on the top of anyone's list, in my opinion. So she'd be on your short list? I think she'll be on everyone's short list. Whether she wants to do it or not, you'll have to ask her. Her plate is full, as she says. She has her hands full in South Carolina and a young family, but I can tell you she's incredibly talented, and, uh, and I think whoever the nominee is, and I believe it will be me, uh, she's someone that people are going to be paying attention to. Senator Rubio, thank you. Thanks for coming in today. Safe travels, sir. Thank you.